Hey everybody, welcome to Repeal Day Expo. I hope you're having a great time. And I'm very excited to be able to be here today to be able to talk to you about quit chasing the hype because we all get caught up in figuring out what's coming or what have we heard about that we've got to try because if we do it, then the heavens will open up and then they'll start shining down on me. But today I'm really going to be here to try to show you the 10 bourbon and rise that you need to try and really what I think that you should be going after and trying to sample along with as well. But you know, who am I? And I guess, why should you care about what I say? So my name is Kenny Coleman. I am one of the hosts of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. I'm also joined by my co-founder, Ryan, and as well as Fred Minnick, who is a part of the podcast, and my wife, Lauren, who does all of the audio remastering and production and everything like that in the back end that makes it sound just as good as it does. But we interview, you name it, anybody in the bourbon industry from all the big wigs down to some craft distillers, we have them on the podcast to do a few different things. You know, one, we want to kind of expose the personalities of the people that you love to drink. So if you're a big fan of Booker's or Knob Creek and you want to know more about Fred and Freddie No, go and check out the podcast because you get to see them in their raw form and raw form and really understand like who they are as a person. Or if you like Four Roses, want to know more about Brett Elliott go on. You can go ahead. We've got podcasts with him on as well. So really what we try to do is expose some of the personalities behind the brand. We also have episodes with the Bourbon Community Roundtable with some of the people that you've seen here today, such as Brian Haar from Sippin' Corn, Blake from Bourboner, the guys from Breaking Bourbon, and of course, Fred. We all come on and kind of talk about what's the latest news in bourbon. We take a potpourri of bourbon topics and really kind of hash it out. And it's a really fun episode that we do it live on YouTube and Facebook and everybody can come and be a part of the recording and kind of watch it in real time as well. We have over 300 podcasts that are out there. So if you're looking for some way to kind of get ramped up really quickly, you can go ahead and do that. You can go to our website at bourbonpursuit.com and we have all of our podcasts actually listed by distillery, by bourbon 101. I mean, you name it, we've got it in there. Bourbon women, I'm telling you, we've touched a lot of things, and we've got a lot more coming as well. We're getting ready to go into our next season of recording, so really looking forward to bringing in a lot more great content for everybody as well. Um, as I'd mentioned, we've been featuring a lot of trade magazines, uh, Whiskey Advocate, Louisville.com, Bourbon Plus. I mean, there's a lot of them out there, but you can find us on any podcast platform, whether it's Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora, and if you are more of a video person, you like that visual aspect, we have all of the video podcasts that are available on YouTube as well. And if you're in the Bardstown area, Bardstown, Kentucky, you can also catch us on AMFM Radio every Wednesday from 9 to 10 a.m. Now, the other things that also about the podcast is that we have now done over 3 million all-time streams. We're doing about one and a quarter million downloads per year. We are ranked consistently in the top 10 for iTunes or Apple Podcasts within inside of the food category. And we are the highest, highest rated and most reviewed whiskey podcast out there. So please go and check us out. We release every Thursday is our main podcast release. And on Tuesdays, we release what's called a whiskey quickie, where Ryan and I, we will actually do a whiskey review in 60 seconds. So really quick, and you get your nose taste and finish, whether it's thumbs up, thumbs down, or somewhere in the middle. And of course, you can follow us on all the socials on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, yes, and even more on TikTok. So go and find us out there and you can follow us of all the things that we're doing and kind of what we're going on. We've got things like a, a private barrel club that you can get along, uh, get involved with as well. And we're supported through Patreon. So if you want to go and find out more, you can go to bourbonpursuit.com, click on the private barrel club, or you can go to patreon.com slash bourbonpursuit. But the other thing that we also have going on is that Ryan and I, uh, one of my co-founders, Ryan, we have also launched Pursuit Spirits. So I didn't put this in the top 10 things that you should go try, but honestly, I think you should. So we have two different offerings. So we have Pursuit Series and Pursuit United. Pursuit Series is our single barrel uh, uh, offering extension. And what this is, these are barrels that Ryan and I, we get to go and hand select from about 40 or 50 different barrels. And really, we choose the best of the best of really what we want. It's all bottled at cash strength, non-chill filtered. And as we really kind of get that source market advantage, because anybody that knows the way the source market works, you kind of throw a check at it and you get barrels that show up we get to actually hand pick and kind of cherry pick all the barrels we want. So we're really lucky that we're able to do that. We're also working on more collaborations with other craft distilleries of actually putting their whiskey in our bottle and giving them all the accolades that they deserve and attribution. You can get that 
on our website as well. We're working with, with places like Woodenville and Finger Lakes uh, and Starlight Distillery. So a lot of good things that are coming as well. And on the label in itself, we have this idea of show notes. So if you're a podcast listener, you might know the idea of show notes that tells you what's actually inside the podcast. Well, this is our kind of spin on flavor notes as well. And on Pursuit United, this is a small batch blend that we have coming out. Actually, I think it's maybe next week is when it's coming out. So make sure you uh, get ready to get the credit card ready, if you will. Uh, it'll be available for purchase at sealbox.com as well as a few different neighboring states. And it'll go in towards January. And we have a bigger release coming in of March of 2021. This is a non-chill filtered 108 proof. And we are partnering with a few different distilleries to make this happen. We are partnering with Barstown Bourbon Company, Finger Lakes Distilling, and another non-disclosed, but not in Tullahoma, one in Tennessee. The bourbon is available now. We have the rum barrels already laid down, and we'll be working on the rye relatively soon. All right, so getting into this, I want to say quit chasing the hype, because this is a problem that we all face. We all think of, well, what's coming? What's up next? What are these little horse toppers on these, these circle bottles that we really want to find, and we got to collect all the letters? Or what's about this guy that's smoking a cigar in the front of the label that I hear all these grand things about that people are paying thousands of dollars for these bottles? I'm here to tell you to quit chasing the hype. And I'll get into more of that here in a second. Because we all see this time and time again. Somebody goes and they try bourbon for the first time. And, you know, this is kind of just a, a really kind of funny meme. But if you talk to liquor store owners, this is kind of true. Anybody that goes in, they have signs that says, no, sorry. We do not have Blantons. And you see that all over the country, and people are going crazy for this particular type of bottle. Now, I get it. Don't get me wrong. It's good whiskey in the day, but it doesn't deserve some of the hype that it really gets. And I'll kind of get into that here in a minute. Because we see that, you know, I'm kind of picking on Buffalo Trace here. Because you see, these are the bottles that really a lot of people care about, and they just go crazy for. And don't get me wrong. Buffalo Trace has some of the best products on the market. Heck, maybe... It might be some of the best products on the market, the way that it seems. However, we've got to start expanding our horizon and figure out what else is out there. In Buffalo Trace, they know that it's an issue. They know that they couldn't foresee this typical boom that's coming, and they can't supply enough. Believe me, if you could supply this much demand, you'd want to do it because you don't want to sit there and you want to have money now in your pocket. You don't have to wait years. But that's the problem with bourbon is that we have to put it down now and wait X amount of years until it starts ready or actually gets ready. But why do people only really care about these particular kinds of whiskeys? Well, even the experts, we tell you to stop. We tell you to stop looking for these particular bottles because there's a lot of other good stuff out there. Even Fred Minnick has said that Blanton's has never scored high for him in competitions. And Wade Woodard, who's actually been a friend of the show and he's all on the bourbon forums. He's actually put this in here and he does blind tastings with Blanton's and puts it across, uh, you know, five or six different other bourbons and has people rate them in a, a Google doc. And he says on average, it scores about a two out of five for most people. So it kind of gives you an idea that you should be drinking stuff blind. So you kind of remove this premonition of really what's in the bottle or what's on the label. And for myself, I always, I feel bad. I dog on Weller Special Reserve because it just wasn't for me. I always think it about it's great for mixing, but beyond that, I really don't want it. However, for a lot of people, it's their well. It's what they have in their bar all the time. And it's a really good weeded bourbon. But the problem is, is when you start looking about really what's it look like on paper. You know, Blanton's and Weller Special Reserve, six to eight years old, non-age dated, 93 and 90 proof. It's really not that special when you start thinking about, is it that crazy? Should you be going and chasing after it? There's really nothing there that really garners that kind of attention if you look at it just what's on paper. So why are people still chasing after these particular types of whiskeys? Well, the FOMO, it's real. And new bourbon releases really have that, that effect on people. The problem is I think that more people are informed now more than ever about new releases. Well, you also have the first part that a lot more people are getting into bourbon. And once you get into bourbon, you start on this trail, this expedition of wanting to know more, more and more, kind of being just more educated about the product and the process in itself. And when you go through that, you end up finding podcasts, you end up finding books, you end up finding blogs that you really sort of connect with. 
And when that happens, you end up paying attention. You start figuring out, well, okay, well, what's new? What are they talking about? What should I be paying attention to? Then it starts, well, if the people in the whiskey media are now talking and saying like, oh, you've got to go get the next Parker's Heritage or you've got to try this or try that, don't be wrong. It actually starts a little bit of a stir crazy. So we end up actually making the problem for ourselves sometimes because we'll get samples from different distilleries and we'll rate them, review them and put them out there. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people chase after them. Now, don't be wrong. I'm not going to say that we put ourselves on a pedestal that people should be listening to this. That's not it at all. A lot of people don't actually. But anytime there's something new with the word limited next to it, people start going crazy. And it's for a few different things because one, you've got the market in itself is just crazy because you can buy something for $50 and turn around and sell it for $250 an hour later as soon as you walk out the store. So you have this the secondary market that's actually driving a lot of people to just not even drink, but just to buy it and hoard or to buy it and resell. And you also have things like spirits competitions. If we look back at San Francisco in 2018, when Henry McKenna won the best overall bourbon out of hundreds that were entered, it became a overnight sensation. Now, we have known about Henry McKenna for a long time. We called it one of the best values in bourbon because it was $34.99, maybe uh, $39.99, 10-year-old bottled and bond, which is 100 proof, which looks really good on paper, and it's a really good product. But it kind of caught on. And once the hype train starts catching on, then it's hard to find it. And so now we don't see Henry McKenna on the shelves anymore. Now, we can look at this as well as it's an influence of not only just whiskey media, but even traditional media when you see things uh, such as a Blanton's bottle on a particular movie or a TV set, you know, you know, you start, you start kind of uh, feeling the FOMO yourself, and you're like, okay, I kind of want that bottle. And don't be wrong, it's a really good, and it's a, it's a really nice looking bottle too. Great marketing, but this is also when frustration sets in because as somebody that's either getting into whiskey or new to whiskey, and you say, okay, well, I want to go and see what these people are talking about, all these great whiskeys that are out there, I want to try them. Well. That's the problem now is that if you haven't gotten into whiskey, you're just now getting into it, you're going to realize that everything's on allocation. Henry McKenna, Elmer T. Lee. Um, I mean, these are the things that just used to sit on the shelves all the time. And now everything's on allocation. You'll never touch it. And so nothing's going to hit the shelf. Everything goes right into the back room and it's going to be relationships for everything. So whether you're in good with the store owner, you'll be able to you know, say like you've been a good customer this year and here's your one bottle or everything goes into a lottery because they don't know how to be able to do that and spread it amongst all their customers or most stores they just don't care and we kind of see exactly what we see in these pictures you know back in 2011 the antique collection would just sit on the shelves it, it would just sit there and 60 dollars take as much as you want and today add an extra nine in there and that's what we see. So we've seen the market and how it's shifted in just a, a short amount of time from something that is a, an everyday commodity to something that is actually super rare. Now, at the same exact time, three-tier systems don't help the process anymore either. As a consumer, it's frustrating because we would see these prices going to a liquor store, a $600 bottle that a liquor store is charging when we know that Buffalo Trace or whomever is sending it, they're sending it at a price that is a wholesale price. So the store in itself is probably buying it for somewhere less than $70. And the problem exists because as a consumer, we have no other option than to buy it from a retail store. We can't buy it direct from the manufacturer. We can't buy it direct from a distributor. So the, the three tier system is kind of broken in regards of what we can do as consumers. And of course we can say, well, just don't buy from the store problem is is somebody's going to buy from the store and that's just the 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 ups and downs of supply and demand and you know who has money and who doesn't but we are going to see brands start changing a little bit they're starting to price their products a little bit higher because they want to offset some of the costs that they might be missing in the 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 retail market in itself so they're going to start inching up little by little but you're really not going to find it being too crazy out of hand because a lot of distilleries look at this as the long game what can they do to continually keep putting out new products every year and sustain it for a long time? Because you don't want to sit there and try to do a money grab today and lose a valued customer. And for a lot of bourbon hunters, it is. It's the thrill of the hunt. 
I was there at one point too, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that are just now getting into it. You're driving around, you're going to all these stores, hitting up connections, and you score a bottle or two or six, whatever it is. And it really do, you get a thrill out of it. And you're excited at the end of the day because now you've, you've learned about it, you're excited to actually go and taste these products for yourself. Now for a lot of us, we wanna figure out, well, what are some things that are really readily accessible that we wanna be able to try? And so here's 10 bourbons and ryes that you need to try, and I'm gonna give you some of the background behind it too. So first off, we're gonna look at 1910 and 1920 coming from Old Forester. This is part of the Whiskey Row series, and we got schooled on it back on an episode 177 with Jackie Zykin, where she came on and really gave us the history about what was going on with it. Now, for the most part, they have two other ones. They have the 1870 uh, original batch and the 1897 bottle and bond, but for whiskey lovers out there, 1910 and 1920 are the sweet spots. And for 1910, goes through a second barreling process that most people have kind of known about. It's, it's nothing new with inside of the industry. You take a fully matured whiskey and you dump it into a new charred oak barrel to kind of get some more of the flavor characteristics out of it. Now, 1920, I put it right here as May Reign Supreme because for a lot of whiskey lovers out there, it really kind of really shows through as one very good, high quality product. It wins consistently in blind competitions and even against itself in its own limited edition releases. So if you look at things like King of Kentucky or any other kind of uh, Old Forester birthday bourbon, you name some of the stuff that's also coming from Old Forester and try to pair it up against 1920. 1920 also comes out ahead pretty, uh, pretty regularly. As an honorable mention here, I wanted to also put Old Forester rye on here. I believe it's like less than a $20 price point and it's a stellar rye, so make sure you go and check that out. But the Whiskey Row series, it's around a 50 or $60 SRP. Coming at number nine, Maker's Mark Private Selections. Now this is gonna kind of like run a huge gambit here because there are a thousand and one possible stave combinations. And here's what this really means. If you know anything about the program, you would go, it's not like the private barrel program where you go and select a single barrel. Instead, what you do is you go and you taste different variants of whiskey that has been uh, quote unquote flavored by finishing staves. Now it's not like actually putting in, you know, droplets of flavor. It's actually putting in staves that have undergone some sort of convection or anything like that. So you have five different ones on here. I'm not going to name them all for you because you can read for yourself, but you take uh, different amounts of each of those and it creates a varied flavor profile. Now the whiskey in itself is uh, five to seven years old, and it spends nine weeks in a cold condition with the flavoring staves inside of the barrel. It's also bottled at cask strength, so you're looking around 108 to 114 proof, and on average, it's around 75 to $80. If you want to hear more about this, back on episode 146, we actually interviewed Bill Samuels Jr., who's the chairman uh, of Maker's Mark. He's the one who kind of brought it out and made it a resurgence, and he's really the marketing engine that made this as as successful as it is and so make sure you go and you can kind of talk about his baby which was makers 46 so moving on to number eight jack daniels barrel proof now you might be thinking what jack dan it's not a bourbon well it's not not bourbon and if you want to know why you can actually go and i'm gonna of course i'm gonna plug the podcast and every single one of these so just get ready for it so episode 150 we interviewed jeff arnett who was the former master distiller at jack daniels and tried to settle it once and all and saying, is Jack Daniels a bourbon? And, you know, he kind of says, and what you see everywhere else is that it is and it isn't at the same exact time. It, it is a bourbon because it follows all of the necessary rules to be called a bourbon. However, they don't want to be designated as that and they want to take their designation as Tennessee whiskey. So take it for what it is. However, this particular offering we feel is underrated and overlooked. Even for myself, this is something that I never even thought that I would be a big Jack Daniels fan until the hype train actually told me to do it. And it really is. It's true. There was a lot of Facebook forums and groups out there that really started getting on and talking about Jack Daniels barrel proof. And I said, all right, well, I guess let's see what this is all about. Sure enough, fell in love with it. And I think it is something that a lot of people are starting to fall in love with because you can do single barrel selections of this as well. And so being able to go and select your own single barrel of Jack Daniels and having it come out around 120 to even 140 plus proof, it's a pretty rare offering. Now, the other thing about this is that Jack Daniels, there really isn't a whole lot of stuff, I believe that's over like six years old there, maybe maybe even less than that. So you don't get a whole lot of like variety that gets a, a super high age range. So that's kind of a, a unique thing about Jack Daniels because they are continually churning stuff in and out of there all the time. It is 
the number one world's uh, largest selling whiskey brand that is out there. We have uh, found out that there is a rye version of this coming soon, so it's actually very, very good. For the longest time, you could only get the Jack Daniels rye in a 375 in the gift shop there in Lynchburg, Tennessee. And this is coming at around a 60 to $75 SRP. Now, number seven, Chattanooga whiskey. I know, again, on the Tennessee train here, but seriously, hear me out. We kind of found out about Chattanooga whiskey through Blake over at Sealbox, and it was one thing that we ended up getting like a media kit. And a lot of times we get media kits and we're kind of like, okay, like let's let's see what this is all about. And it really surprised us because it has this malt forward approach and how they distill things, and it's very chocolatey when you taste it at the end. And so they've got two different variants out there. They got their 91 and 111 proof. And if you go listen to this podcast, because it's episode 267, we had Tim Pearson and Grant McCracken on. Tim is the co-founder and a diehard entrepreneur at heart. And it really kind of goes to show you the spirit that you have as an entrepreneur to continue investing and trying things until you find something that works. And so they had... I believe it was like 90 something different uh, experiments of whiskey going on. And I think 91, if I recall correctly, is because they found barrel 91 was the 91st experiment. And they were like, this is it. This is the one we're going to go with. So way too much experimentation that would have been comfortable for me. But that is the entrepreneurship at heart that hopefully a lot of people can kind of really see as, as value as it comes out of it. They also have a new really released rye as well, and it still has that malt forward approach. And these are coming in at $30 for the 91 proof, $40 to $50 for the 111 as well as the rye. All right. Hopefully you're kind of seeing where this is going. I got a lot of things I'm going to kind of throw at you. You might not have been expecting, but number six, four roses, small batch select. You can't go wrong with four roses ever. You never can, whether it's a single barrel or whether it's the yellow label or even the small batch, they're always good. Never had a bad four roses. Now the small batch select was, it came out, I believe a year and a half or maybe two years ago. It is higher proof than the standard yellow label or, and the standard small batch. You get that. You also get a combination of six of their recipes and they have 10 total recipes, but you get a combination of six of these. So 104 proof, non-chill filtered, and six to seven year old, six to seven year old bourbons. It is a great product, a great showing, a great offering. Now this is a little bit more expensive compared to their standard small batch and the yellow label. However, it is on par with their standard 100 proof single barrel offering, but it is cheaper than their barrel strength single barrel offering, which can sometimes creep up to 80 to $90 now. So at $60, it's a fantastic whiskey for the price point. And Four Roses is just one of those iconic distilleries where you can really taste the history that kind of went into what Jim Rutledge had done to actually like turn the ship around uh, and really make Four Roses the powerhouse that it is today. And of course, we've got podcasts out there about it as well. We actually did a whiskey quickie on this exact uh, offering. So you can kind of see our review out there as well. Number five, early times bottled and bond. This one is for us. It, I don't know if it was really surprising, but I remember the first time that we tried it again, another media sample that came in the mail and we were like, what, what early times is a bourbon. What do you mean? Because it's been a blended whiskey for the longest time when it was been under, under Brown Foreman. And now they're coming back as a bottled and bond bourbon. All right, well, let's check this out. Oddly enough, it ended up winning our 2019 Bottled and Bond competition of like 20-something different uh, Bottled and Bond whiskeys. It is fantastic, and it comes in a one liter for less than $20. If you do not have this on your shelf, you are making a huge mistake because it works well whether you're drinking it neat, whether you're drinking it on the rocks, whether you're in a cocktail, because at 100 proof, the whiskey still shines really, really good in a cocktail here. Now, I would also say that this is kind of unsure about where this is going to go in the future because it has now changed hands and it's now under Sazerac, which owns, of course, Buffalo Trace and Elmer T. Lee and all the other products that we talked about being so allocated you can't find anymore. Now, a lot of people have said this is the next kind of like dagger of a, 
of a bottle, or sorry, of a bourbon that you could find on the shelf that was rel- that was really good at a low price point. However, they Sazerac has also purchased the stocks to this particular whiskey as well. So we're going to see the same stocks available in this early times bottled and bond whiskey for a few more years. So I would suggest you go out there and buy a few bottles and stock up because this is one that you're going to want to savor the flavor for. Moving on to number four, Woodenville Cash Strength Rye. We got turned on to Woodenville, I would say, uh, about a year and a half ago. And this was when we had their 90 proof or 93, 93 proof offering. And we ended up putting it in a blind competition with Fred Minnick against Pappy 23. And it almost won. It came in second out of a line of like seven or eight bourbons. That shows you just the power of really what this particular distillery is doing. It's, a, it's an hour away from Seattle. It was one of the projects that Dave Pickerel, the late great famous Dave Pickerel, had a hand in. And so he definitely was part of the instrumentation of, of really putting them on the right path. But you know, hats off to Brett Carlisle, who is the master distiller there, uh, and, and really and the and co-founder as well, and, and really what they're doing and making such great products. Now, as I mentioned, I talked about the bourbon, but I'm, I want to actually want to talk about the rye. So the first time that we tried the rye was when Ryan and I flew out to Seattle to actually go and purchase barrels that were going to go under our own private label for Pursuit Series. And they brought out a few rye whiskeys for us to try, and we were blown away. And we're like, wait, can't we just buy one of these instead? And they're like, well, not yet. It's still too limited in distribution. We can't do that yet. But this is another one. It's going to be kind of hard to find because it is not in all the states that they are distributed. So you're going to have to go and search a little bit harder to be able to find it. Um, of course, it'll always be available at the distillery. So maybe you've got a friend in the Seattle, Woodenville area. It's around $80 as well for this, but it's also going to come in around 120 to 130 proof. So it's a really great sip and rye whiskey. Super sweet. Guarantee you're going to like this one as well. All right, moving along. Number three, Elijah Craig 18. All right, probably going to catch some flack for this one. Why are you going to put a limited release bourbon somewhat allocated on here um, as something that somebody, everybody has to go and try? Well, I'm saying this because I feel like Elijah Craig 18 is a whiskey that can compete with a lot of other great whiskeys that have this super premium age spot. I mean, 18 years, that's a long time in the barrel. And I've had this, I, you know, I actually made this presentation. I was like, all right, I'm going to go back and try my Elijah Craig 18 again, just to make sure I'm like, am I, am I sure that I really want to put this on here? And I still love it. I mean, it's got this complex oak character that you just can't get with a lot of these six to eight year old bourbons. I mean, this something is, it is something that is super rich and super complex that you're going to be able to try to get out of it. Now for myself, I like the, the, Elijah Craig 18, not a fan of Elijah Craig 23. I think it's too woody, too over at that point. But 18, for some reason, it just sits really, really well with me. Now, this used to be a $65 bottle on the shelf, available all the time. It's now crept up to 135 150 even 180 in parts of the countries. Now, it's difficult to find, but it's not impossible. It's even available at the gift shop at Heaven Hill, from time to time. So make sure you go and check it. Now, the other thing that's kind of on and off about this is that these are single barrels. It's not a huge batch product. So it's going to vary a little bit from place to place, but from the barrels that I've had, they've always been fantastic. And so that's why I say, if you're looking for something that has a high age range and you want to try to figure out like, what is that complexity I'm talking about when you talk about Oak and everything like that compared to something that's in the five to eight year range, this is one of those whiskeys that you're going to want to try. All right, moving on. We're getting close. Number two, Pikesville Rye. I know I felt like I put too much love at Heaven Hill here at number two and number three, but honestly, Pikesville Rye is just pound for pound, one of the best ryes for the price point out there. Six to eight years old, 110 proof, 50 to $60. I mean, checkbox, right? I mean, it hits everything that you need. Now, this isn't something that's coming from the MGP powerhouse. This is a Kentucky rye whiskey. And, you know, funny enough, if you go and listen to episode 231, where we interviewed the the newest master distiller at Heaven Hill, Connor O'Driscoll, he actually talks about Pikesville rye when he started learning about the Heaven Hill portfolio. 
And he thought that it was actually something that was being distilled in Pikesville, Kentucky. He had no idea that it actually came from Heaven Hill. So there's a lot of good, interesting little anecdotes about that in here. But I know a lot of other whiskey geeks out there also really enjoy Pikesville rye because it hits a lot of those check boxes. And again, it's a solid rye for the price. And if you try to put this against other limited edition ryes that are going to be creeping up to a hundred to two hundred dollars, and you try to compare it against it, it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard to justify some of those price points when you've got something solid right here at fifty to sixty dollars. That's always on the shelves. All right, now moving on to number one. Honestly, it probably shouldn't be a surprise for anybody, but I put anything wild turkey. I think anybody that's in the whiskey world, they know that this is the best value in bourbon. It's been over overlooked and undervalued for so far and so long. I mean, you've got a whole variant range of what products that they put out here. And if we look at just the base, you've got Wild Turkey 101. It's great for anything. I mean, and you're looking at what, $15, $18 for a 750? Super cheap. Super cheap, really good whiskey. And I think it got a wrap as being bad for so long because everybody's like, oh, Wild Turkey 101, you just want to shoot it back. It's a great sipping whiskey too. Now, Russell's and Rare Breed are fan favorites. Rare Breed in itself wins a lot of blind competitions because it is a barrel proof offering and it is sub or around $50. And so when you want to go ahead and you want to try to put that against other limited edition releases that are coming out that are $500 and you taste them blind, you're going to be pretty... Uh, impressed about what it's going to be able to do. Russell's Reserve is a fan favorite because you can go and do single barrel picks with Eddie in the Rick House. When I say Eddie, Eddie Russell, who's been on the podcast multiple times, as well as Jimmy Russell. Um, we've had a lot of the Russells on the podcast, so make sure you go and you can check that out too. And you kind of hear a lot of their story and their history, which is fantastic. But Russell's Reserve picks are a fan favorite. Everybody loves them because they're coming in at 110 proof which is really great because most of the times they're only like 112 to 118 proof out of the barrel. So just a small amount of water is being added into the whiskey in itself to be able to bring it to its final proofing point. So a lot of that flavor from the barrel is still held in there versus when you look at things either coming from Heaven Hill and other places, a lot of those times those barrels are coming in at 125 to 140 proof and you've got to cut them down a lot with water to get it down to even 100 proof. So that's why Russell's really retains a lot of those flavor characteristics. And now limited releases, sometimes they're they're hard to find, especially the Russell's Reserve limited releases, but you know, the Master's Keep, um, the Decades editions, they're not really too hard to find and, and they're not crazy uh, to go after in the secondary world or anything like that. So if you want to see what a 17-year-old wild turkey edition tastes like and you're willing to cough up you know 200 bucks or 300 bucks you can go ahead and do it it's 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 always going to be it's not going to always be there for you but odds are are going to be more in your favor to be able to find that particular limited edition release than anything else and they've also announced rare breed rye will be coming soon so be on the lookout for that with that i want to say thank you everybody for checking in and staying with us for this Quit chasing the hype, the 10 best bourbon and ryes, at least that I think that you should go and you should try. Make sure you subscribe and check out Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcast. And also make sure you check out PursuitSpirits.com to see all the new releases we have coming. Cheers, everybody, and have a great and awesome repeal day. Cheers. <laughs>